guys, it's Poe back again with Let's Get Techie. So as of late, AMD has, they've been knocking it out of the park. Um, Ryzen was a huge success. Uh, it's a great line of processors for the money. Um, Threadripper also, even though it's on the uh, more expensive side of things, it is fantastic performance when you compare it to what Intel has for the same amount of money. Um, unfortunately, I think they are making a huge mistake upping the price of Vega. I feel like that is going to be a complete flop. Uh, they've upped the price on the 64 by $100, and they've also upped the price on the 56 by $100 as well. So, unfortunately, I'm not as excited for Vega as I was. You won't be seeing any Vega content from me on this channel. Um, maybe some criticisms of it, but we won't be looking at any Vega cards. Um, but today, we're going to take a look at one of their Ryzen CPUs. We're looking at their budget line. So this is the R3 1300X. This is the same CPU that we're giving away along with the Asus Strix B350 motherboard. It's a great combo, especially for what it is going for, what I paid for it. Um, the motherboard has some really nice features. Uh, the only thing that I did not care for was the voltage control in the BIOS. So it only allows you to use a voltage offset rather than a voltage override. And that was my phone. That was my phone again. Yeah. So they only allow you to control the voltage via uh, an offset. So you have a baseline voltage and then you have to increase it from there in millivolts. And I don't care for that, but it's not a deal breaker. Um, let's go ahead and hop right in and take a look at performance and then we're going to be announcing the giveaway winner at the end of this video so make sure that you stay tuned. Taking a closer look at the motherboard we have four USB 3.0 ports on the back, two USB 2.0, two USB 3.1 type A, a display port and HDMI for upcoming APUs as well as gigabit LAN and eight channel audio. Since this is a B350 motherboard, it does not support SLI. You can do Crossfire though, and the two slots that you would use for Crossfire are armor plated. It has six SATA 6 ports, as well as one M.2 slot. When using the M.2, you do lose two of your SATA 6 connections. In regard to fan headers, you do have a total of six. Two are dedicated to the CPU, there's three chassis fan headers, and one dedicated to an all-in-one liquid cooling pump if you choose to go that route. And finally, you do get the inclusion of one internal USB 3.0, as well as two internal 2.0 ports, and two RGB headers. Our overclock testing was done at 4040 megahertz using a Cooler Master Master Liquid Light 120 millimeter AIO. The memory used was a kit of Trident Z RGB from G-Skill and overclock testing we ran it at 2800 megahertz with a voltage of 1.4 and a latency of 15. OS and games were stored on a Crucial MX300 M.2 SATA 3 drive. We chose to use a Founders Edition GTX 1080 for testing in hopes to keep the bottleneck shifted to the CPU. This 1080 was run at stock speeds for all testing. Rounding it up is our 750 watt Supernova G3 from EVGA. All testing was done on a clean install of Windows 10 Professional version 1703 build 15063.540 an NVIDIA Wickle Driver 382.53. BIOS was the latest available at the time of testing, which was 0809. Taking a look at temperatures, the standout point is the voltage the motherboard pumped into this chip when left at auto settings in the BIOS. You are seeing correctly, we saw 1.439 volts, and occasionally it went even higher. If you're planning on buying this board, even if you don't want to overclock, please take the time to manually set voltages. This will greatly decrease temperatures and strain on the VRM. We were only able to sustain an overclock of 3.745 GHz across all cores with the stock Wraith Stealth Cooler, which by the way is made by Cooler Master, in case you didn't know. 
Switching to the Cooler Master Master Liquid Light 120, we were able to push this chip to 4.04 GHz at 1.41 volts. This actually netted us a decrease in idle temperatures over the stock configuration and virtually identical load temps. Moving into synthetic testing, here are our results in Cinebench. We saw a 12% increase in single core performance with the overclock applied, as well as a 19% increase in multi-core. These numbers put Intel's i5 lineup right in the R3's crosshair. For comparison, the i5-7500 scores mid-150s for single core and just over 600 in multi-core. This is a very impressive result for the 1300X. Here we can see how the 1300X performs in Blender. For testing, we use the Ryzen graphic that we saw AMD using during the R7 launch to compare their flagship 1800X against Intel's Broadwell E lineup. In stock form, the 1300X finished the task in 68 seconds, and when overclocked, we see an 8 second reduction. For our next synthetic test, we chose Geekbench 4. Here we see a 13% increase in single core performance when overclocked and a massive 34% increase in multi-core. This again puts it in very close competition with Intel's KB Lake 7500 chip, which sees a single core score in the 4700 range and a multi-core score of just over 13,000. For our last synthetic test, we chose ASUS RealBench to give this chip a real workout. In this test, we saw some dramatic increases in performance from the 4.04 GHz overclock. The image editing sees a 19% increase and the overall system score sees a 24% performance jump. These are some great gains considering it only took us 30 minutes to dial in the overclock. Moving on to gaming, here we take a look at Dirt 3, GTA 5, Hitman, and Rise of the Tomb Raider. Dirt 3 performs smoothly both at stock and overclocked and we see some good scaling when overclocked, 12% in average frame rate and 21% in 1% lows. It's much the same with performance in GTA 5. We had no stuttering and gameplay felt very smooth. Unfortunately though, we don't see as much performance scaling in this title. In Hitman, we were forced to run in DX11 as DX12 was a stuttering, unplayable mess. Performance was much better in DX11 and left us with a game that was actually playable. In Rise of the Tomb Raider, we got some great average frame rates with 1% lows that don't look particularly bad, but unfortunately I would say the game is unplayable without lowering settings quite a bit. We did run it in DX11 and DX12, and it was much the same with both APIs. In Doom, we chose to use the ever-popular Vulkan API. Most agree that it helps performance across the board, but that AMD's graphical architecture shows better gains than Nvidia. Here we see that the game is very much playable on the 1300X, overclocked or not. In The Division, we were able to run DX12 without issue, and again, another very playable game for this CPU, even at max settings. Rainbow Six Siege was able to eke out just above 60 FPS for an average, both in stock and overclocked form, however we see much tighter 1% low values when overclocked. Ghost Recon Wildlands is not known for its great optimization on PC, and here we can see the 1300X struggle a bit at max settings. It was unable to average the 60 FPS that most shoot for, and the 1% lows were very close to half that at 31 and 37 for stock and overclocked respectively. Rounding out our gaming test, we took a look at Battlefield 1. In this title, you will either need to overclock the 1300X or lower your settings as it was not playable at stock clocks. Overclocked, on the other hand, it was flawless. So let's go ahead and wrap this one up. I want to talk a little bit about the performance of this chip. Um, so as you can see, it played most of our games flawlessly at 1080p. Some of them on max settings. Actually, I would say most of them on max settings. Uh, the one game that we had some trouble with was Rise of the Tomb Raider. I would not put much stock in that just because it has been so inaccurate in the past. Uh, it's one that I like to put in and it's one that uh, a lot of other reviewers use, but I would not use that to judge the CPU only. Um, it performed great and everything else. We did have to lower some settings in some games. Um, Rise of the Tomb Raider is just a bad game. I'm sorry if you play Rise of the Tomb Raider. I, I don't care for it at all. Uh, it's very uh, glitchy. 
Um, I just don't care for it. I throw it in there because a lot of other people bench it. Probably shouldn't even bench with it anymore, to be honest. Um, so yeah, I think this combo is well worth the money if you're thinking about getting into PC gaming. If you haven't PC gamed before, uh, if you're looking for a good budget setup to run at 1080p, I think this is hands down going to be the best option for that price point. Uh, we'll see what Intel has with Coffee Lake coming up. Their new i3s are supposed to be quad core, so that could shake things up a bit. So we'll wait, we'll see what that brings. Um, and with that, we're going to go ahead and end it. We uh, did draw a winner this evening. <laughs> Hang on, I've got to see who it was. I forgot. Andrew McKinney! Yeah, I said that right. Andrew McKinney. Congratulations, Andrew. Uh, you will be getting this CPU and motherboard. I really hope that it goes to good use. Um, I hope you don't already have like a 7700K and a 1080 Ti. Um, hopefully, you're really in need of, uh, of a processor and motherboard, but either way, it's going to you, man. Um, congratulations to you. I really hope that you enjoy it. Um, hopefully you can let us know how you feel about it once you get it. Maybe uh, come check us out on social media and post some pictures of the finished build. Um, that is going to do it for this one. I appreciate everybody who has subscribed to the channel. I appreciate everybody who entered the contest. Uh, we will be doing more, so uh, don't feel bummed out that you didn't win anything. We'll have plenty more coming. Um, make sure to hit a like on this video. Uh, the more the better. We appreciate all the support. Um, hit us up on social media. Get subscribed if you aren't already, and we'll see you in the next one.